So today, today we're going to present uh, some of our work here at UGent in structural fire engineering, also focusing on uh, using Saphir. Uh, the presentation has two parts. First, I'm going to do a short presentation about some bench scale experiments that we did in comparison with Saphir of the results. And then Ruben is going to talk about more complex use of Saphir for uh, tunnels. So as I said, uh, I'm going to present uh, bench scale experiments that we did as a part of our okay. uh, part of our uh, post fire assessment project. For these tests, we mm. used our new electric radiant panel. So it's a radiant panel that we use to control the heat flux that we expose to uh, the samples. Uh, it's a uh, electric one, uh, so it's a uh, quasi instantaneous intensity control using the homemade Python interface. We can control the intensity of the panel quite precisely and we we'll know the heat flux that uh, is applied to our specimen uh, in much precision and uh, control almost instantaneously. And also because the panel is electrically powered, there is no combustion, so it's quite safe to be used in a uh, lab, uh, in our labs here. Uh, as you can see here, just the capabilities of electrical panels. So we can have a heat flux area of roughly 700 by 500 millimeters. Uh, at the surface of the radiant panel, we have high heat fluxes of 200 kilowatts per meter square. But at the distance of around 10 centimeters, where usually our specimens are, we can have maximum heat flux of 100 kilowatts per meter square. So we can uh, simulate full natural fire exposure for a lot of different cases. Uh, for our test, we uh, did fire exposure on a limited part of a beam. Here it's uh, how our beam setup looked like. Uh, it's, we used for reverse four-point bending just to do to much more easier way to conduct it if we have the radiation from the top side and also it limited, limits the uh, deformations in mill, so the distance between our panel and our specimen can be uh, more constant during the test. And as you can see in this video, we used uh, put uh, insulation boards on the side so we can only have uh, one dimensional heat transfer from one side. Uh, we measure deflections on the sides and in the middle and also uh, on the bottom side of the beam in the compressor zone, we uh, left part uncovered and use uh, DIC the image, uh, digital image correlation to measure the deformation strain so we can compare better with numerical results. And also you can see a lot of cables for thermocouples. Uh, we measured the temperature uh, at six different points in the cross section. So uh, at the bottom uh, or tension fire exposed side here, let's reverse the picture, uh, we measured uh, the reinforcement temperature and uh, temperature inside the concrete at five different uh, places. And also we did that at three different positions in the heated zone, so we can have much more uh, better idea about the distribution of the temperatures. And for the fire exposure, we use the parametric fire curve, as you can see here with the blue line. So it had a heating duration of one hour and gamma factor of 0.45. And uh, we translated that uh, gas temperature inside of the into a heat flux that we could just uh, apply with the radiant panel uh, that looked like this, like uh, this red curve. So it would uh, simulate the same heat flux that the specimen would experience during a real fire curl with uh, this gas temperature. Uh, this is how the one of the tests look like. Uh, so you can see that uh, the panel itself is quite bright, but uh, it is also quite easy to come nearby and using special glasses to check uh, the condition of the beam and maybe even monitor some other uh, visually, monitor uh, how the beam behaves during the test. So for the test, we did three exactly the same uh, concrete beam with exactly the same uh, fire exposure. and month, well, let's say weeks or months before the test itself, we did a numerical simulation in Saphir with uh, expected values of material properties uh, to simulate what kind of temperatures we're going to expect inside of the, the beam and also how it's going to behave during the whole heating and the cooling phase. So I have to mention that these results so of the numerical simulations are done way before the test. So we didn't uh, tinker anything to 
uh, have good agreement or not. As you can see here on the first graph, we just show how uh, the temperatures that we measured inside of the beam compared to the temperature results in Saphir. Uh, because of the uh, boundary condition of the beam, there was a little bit of a gap between the insulation. So you can see here in Saphir results that we have two lines. One is if we had this case where we have complete insulation on the side and one if we don't have insulation on the side. So if there's a cold air on the side, then we can see that the results from the temperature at different depths here. This one is next to reinforcement and this one is close to the surface, match quite well with Saphir. Uh, similarly for higher uh, depths, and of course we can see this 100 uh, degree plateau, which is not uh, captured so well with Saphir, but uh, still the overall trend is quite well. Uh, what is maybe for me, most important is the deflections that were modeled using Saphir and what we got in the test. As you can see here, this is the midpoint deflection. And uh, there is a high level of match between the all three tests and Saphir results, both in the heating phase and the cooling phase, which shows that Saphir is quite capable of modeling uh, behavior of heated concrete well. Uh, here for the deflections on the sides where the loads are applied, we see a bit of a difference, but that's mostly due to some measuring uh, errors. Uh, the trend of these curves for different beams is exactly the same as the trend for Saphir, but there is a constant difference of half one, two, and three millimeters between the test. But we suspect that's just uh, due to the position of the measuring equipment. And also using the DAC, uh, we measured the, in the middle zone, only in the compressed zone, uh, what is happening with all the deformations. And we were able to uh, plot the curvature, average curvature inside of that heated zone and compare that with results of Saphir. And you can see here, the results match quite well, especially in the heating uh, phase during the cooling phase, we have a little bit of a difference. So to conclude this part, we just wanted to show uh, that uh, using Saphir, uh, you can get, in my opinion, really good uh, match with uh, experiments, especially in this controlled way that we know our heat fluxes quite well. Uh, we know all the loads. And then when we compare it, uh, when we just model it blindly without any adjusting of the results uh, using Sophia, we can still get a really good agreement. And now Ruben is going to talk about the second part. Great, thank you, Alsha. Uh, so the second part is about um, one of the projects we do. So from time to time, we also do industry projects um, on request, basically. And this re relates to a tunnel project. Now, the actual um, project relates to spalling. But before we looked into the spalling case, which we have also done, but we are not presenting today, um, we looked into the performance which an ideal tunnel, and an ideal tunnel as in a tunnel which does not um, exhibit any spalling, or that kind of tunnel would then perform. So a cross-section discretized into different sections with constant properties, some simplification there, um, of course, and the um, rebars, they are, they are lumped together in uh, equivalent rectangular areas. It's for an RWS exposure. Now we use an also the cooling phase, and this will bring some interesting results later on, and especially and also for the client and stakeholders. So talking, for example, to fire brigade people, and um, this cooling phase effect that really opens uh, people's eyes, but more on that later. So, um, the visual here just shows you this kind of a gas temperature. Loading situation, we simplify things quite a lot for this fast calculation with um, clamps at the bottom for our support conditions. This is a curve of, on the one hand side, to our RWS with our exponential cooling. And on the other hand, you have curves for the temperature of the reinforcement, both the bottom reinforcement and the top reinforcement. Now, what is important here is that for a ideal tunnel, so a tunnel where there is no spalling, uh, as designed, the temperature of the reinforcement remains relatively cool. So the assumption of the, the, the designers, the clients and stakeholders, everybody, is that this kind of tunnel would then be behave very nicely. That would probably 
um, have quite limited damage and could easily be repaired if necessary. Now we're going to look at some results of the simulations. And, and I can already tell you that um, a different party has done very detailed modeling actually with 3D uh, solid elements and so on. And global, the global behavior which the, the other party found was matched very, very well with Safir. And so the advantage we had with our calculations there is that we could do many more simulations in at the same time period really. So first, the moment distribution. So I just let you watch that um, again, maybe if if possible. But you, so in the beginning we have the standard moment distribution, then initially in the heating phase over the support, a high increase in this hogging moment. Then in the cooling phase, a quite a bigger reversal there. So now the field moment becomes much, much bigger. And we have quite important uh, deformations, plastic strains at different places in the cross section, in the tunnel cross section, as we're going to show a little bit later, and uh, permanent deformations. Here, close up of different time steps there. So beginning of the fire, zero minutes, 120 when the RWS exposure reaches its peak, 240, 480 during the cooling phase. So a very big difference in moment line. We have similar pictures for actual forces, which I'm not showing here. The key thing for the actual forces is that the internal wall, so the heating, the fire, if for I didn't mention this, but I think this was probably quite clear, is in the left tube of the tunnel. The internal wall in this left tube um, attracts much larger compression forces um, in this simulation. These are deformations. So this is, is a perfect tunnel in the sense that it does not exhibit spalling. It behaves perfectly as uh, people would want it to behave really. But still, even in this kind of situation, we get quite significant permanent um, deformations. We also get cracking on the unexposed side. And these kinds of behaviors apparently are, are not always expected, or at least not by all of the, the stakeholders uh, related to these kind of tunnels. So on the unexposed side, the reinforcement remains perfectly cold, really, but goes into yielding. We get, have very large strains there, which basically means cracking. Uh, so even this perfect tunnel does exhibit, uh, from our perspective, quite significant damage which might uh, require repair. And that already a bit faster than uh, foreseen ends up ends the, the presentation here. The key thing for the presentation is that this tunnel does survive two hour RWS. It was actually designed for one hour. Uh, so it, it worked as it was supposed to be. However, not expected by client and stakeholders, very lar or large or significant residual deformations, cracks on the unexposed side, plastic hinges, and we check this also with by going into Saphir and the details of stresses in the specific elements and so on. So the, the key takeaway there, talking to um, the client, is that fire resistance by itself um, does not imply easy repairability. Um, and on a side note, not part of this presentation, but our results agree, I would say, very well with advanced 3D finite element calculations. And with that, I mean actually solid element calculations um, with detailed cracking and, and things like that. Uh, and then we also did calculations with spalling. What we saw from the spalling uh, simulations is that assumptions on where the spalling is um, define the outcome very much. So if spalling is across the entire cross section, so all the exposed sides are spalling, Every, all the reinforcement there becomes exposed, then we have failure quite early in the fire. If it is in specific zones, and these zones can be quite extensive, um, then depending on the zone you choose, we actually the tunnel can uh, maintain its stability, uh, which many people do not expect because the reinforcement in the tension zone becomes exposed actually, but because of the hogging moment, thermally induced forces, actually in some situations you can still remain, uh, keep stability. And with that, I want to thank you, and we are um, happy to answer any questions.
Thank you very much, Ruben and Basha, for these uh, these two very interesting applications and presentations. Um, comparison with experimental data, comparison with other uh, types of models, with other software other users. That that's really interesting. We have a question from Christian Marouk uh, for Basha and the um, uh, new experimental device that you showed. Can you explain how you model the thermal boundary conditions from these radiant panels in Sapphire? So your Sapphire thermal analysis, what kind of boundary conditions did you apply? Uh, so for Sapphire, just give me a second. Uh, the only thing that I, we did is uh, we just used the uh, gas temperature and model it same as the Euro code. Uh, suggest so we have the gas temperature and based on that we have convective and uh, radiative heat transfer uh, to the to the beam in question. Uh, but uh, in order to obtain this red curve here, the heat flux that we actually applied to our beams, we would first do uh, analysis of a one-dimensional heat transfer with this gas temperature. Then we would calculate what is the heat transfer that is uh, transferred from the gas. A hot gas to the beam and then uh, take that gas and just find which intensity we have to provide to our panel to provide the same uh, radiative uh, uh, heat flux that is equal to the total heat flux that is received by the beam. So it also takes into account how the beam is going to heat up and how it's going to uh, exchange the temperature with the hot gas and so on. And uh, as you can see with the temperatures, we got really good agreement. So that means that our assumptions there were quite good. Okay, yes, thank you. So in Safia, you use a, what we call the frontier condition, same as we do with yeah. ISO yeah. or whatever fire curve, and you apply this uh, blue this blue curve, right? Yeah. And this did you explain that uh, may have missed a part, this blue curve, it is not measured. It is you, you back calculate, or you you adjust your your radiant panels to get the yeah, heat so, flux that, that that are equivalent to that blue curve. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. So we the, the blue curve is just the gas temperature that we chose in this case with a gamma forty five and one hour of heat transfer, and then we calculated how much intense, how much uh, radiative heat flux from the panel we need to provide. So in order to the whole total heat flux to be equal to the one that would be received from this gas temperature. Understood. And you mentioned that you have a, a developed a Python code in house. And I assume that maybe what, that's one of the things the code does. You are able to relate time temperature curve gas, time temperature curves that you want to emulate with yeah. the, the, the conditions and the, the heat flux from the panels? Yeah, exactly. So we're just before that, uh, we do the calculation, we get what is the heat flux, and then we are able to just uh, transfer that into the voltage that we send to our panel, and that way we control it. But in theory, and we tried it out, we can do almost any curve that we want uh, and just make uh, the radiant panel behave that way. So let's say for atris or something, uh, usually you would have to change the distance, but here uh, you can just, based on the intensity, which is really precisely uh, controlled, you can choose any type of uh, curve that you want. Very interesting. Um, okay, let, let's shift gear. I have a question for uh, Ruben on the tunnel. Um, Ruben, you mentioned the uh, spooling, so the simulations you showed were without spooling, and then you, you discussed at the end, the results showing results, the, the effects of spooling. Uh, can you comment a little bit more on that? Since we have a couple of minutes, so notably, um, what modeling technique did you use in Saphir to, to model spooling, or did you, you know, pre-assume a certain quantity and remove those elements? And uh, Gail Brown asked if the, you, you assume spooling of the entire concrete cover, for example, going to the reinforcement. Or what were like the different assumptions and different modeling techniques you used? Yeah, perfect. So to to answer the the specific question first, um, yes, when spalling is assumed, we go we do the entire concrete cover. And um, if we are going to change that assumption in the future, that's possible because that actually uh, will depend also on. I'll, I'll, I'll use the word stakeholders in the sense that we need to then agree um, whether or not additional spalling must be considered. And let's say that the, the issue there is not closed yet. Um, the simulation approach is the same, uh, conceptually at least, 
as far as I understand, as the one used by um, Nan Hua and Negar al Hamid Kouassani and, and some of their work, which some people might be familiar with. So what happens is that you assume a starting time for the spalling, which you can do conservative. We assumed after one minute, so quite early in the fire, spalling starts. And then you assume a fixed spalling rate. So you say, for example, five millimeters uh, per minute. Uh, and then every minute, five millimeter is lost. Now in your thermal calculation in Saphir, you can you can do this by, um, I would, but I would have to ask my team for the specific commands, but basically you, you do a calculation with the full cross section, you calculate the first minute um, up to the first spalling because we conservatively apply the spalling first and not after. Um, the, so five millimeter happens after this one minute. Um, you may have a new cross section, same me uh, meshes, but just the lowest meshes removed. And the temperatures are kept from the previous situation where the, there was no spalling and you reapply this frontier boundary condition. And then you do this in the thermal calculation stepwise. So you go one minute further, you can remove elements, you reapply the frontier condition, you keep the temperature of the previous condition and so on. In the mechanical sim uh, simulations, um, you can then directly use your thermal output file, the original one, so the, the full cross section, with the addition that all the elements which are spalled are put at 1200 degrees Celsius, uh, in the sense that their uh, yeah, strength, stiffness, everything is, is, so they are negligible, let's put it that way. So in the mechanical analysis, you have a full cross section, but the spalled elements are at 1200 degrees. And as uh, Jean-Marc is mentioning, the command is restart. So the, that's correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you very uh, for the detailed answer. Um, very well. So let me see. There was just a question that uh, popped up. Oh, thank you for the question, Dorian, because I was going to ask it as well. Uh, very good question. So uh, you showed comparison or you showed results during the cooling phase for, for both examples, but in the case of the first concrete beam, you have also comparison with test and you have good agreement, including in the cooling phase. So there is a question whether that was obtained with the current Eurocode 2 concrete model that captures notably transient creep strain implicitly, or whether you use the explicit transient creep model. Uh, explicit transient creep model will be used, I think, in both cases. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's actually the standard we use, right? Yeah, yes. well, every time we model concrete, we use that model because it showed quite good results often. Uh, happy to hear that. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> and as a side note, it would be interesting to, sh to see what we get with the current Eurocode model for in the case where you compare with the uh, experimental beam. I wonder if that would be very different or not, but uh, possibly in the cooling phase would be a different. That's a good phase. idea. Um, thank you. We still have a few minutes. If there is any other questions, and even feel free to unmute at this point and um, if you want to ask a question. Any other questions for the team at Ghent? If not, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm interested and you know, I'm curious about this uh, new radiant panel. So I already asked a, a little bit about that, but maybe can you tell us if you have plans, new, you have ongoing experimental work with, with that or plans for, for future uh, tests um, on, on the, uh, with this equipment? Uh, well, we just actually today finished one big campaign about uh, these beams that I presented now. And today we did also the ultimate capacity test and finished that to order to just do post-fire assessment. So in what kind of conditions the beams are after the fire. Soon we're starting a new campaign that's going to look into the behavior of structural glass. So first just starting to use the panel in order to obtain the thermal properties of glass and how the glass heats up with uh, different heat fluxes, different uh, fire exposure, so it's going to be quite difficult because of the just uh, transmissivity of glass itself. And then also in the future, we plan to use uh, the panel on maybe some smaller samples in order to get um, uh, material properties of concrete during the heating and also during the cooling. So both for, for the thermal properties of concrete to mechanical properties and also uh, 
let's say, uh, thermal expansion and how it, uh, what are the residual values and how they're influenced by also the cooling rate. So if we cool something faster or slower, which we can control quite well with this rating panel to know, uh, because there is a lot of data on how concrete behaves or different materials in the heating phase, but the cooling phase is still relatively unknown. So we're hoping to do a lot of experiments in that sense. Yeah, and uh, that last thing is a uh, project of uh, Florian, who is also, also here. Um, and one, one thing, just uh, because it's worth mentioning, is that the, the region panel is, is very um, flexible. And I said, so I had a call a couple of days ago, and this is just talking out, out loud in a way, uh, and with somebody who apparently was interested in very in detailed modeling of, of concrete exposed to fire. And without any introduction to it, the person was basically, let's say, complaining or reasoning as an issue that in normal fire tests you cannot observe the specimen from close by so this is something which you can do here we can you can come very close to a specimen which is being uh, heated to observe cracks and so on we have no immediate plans there but it's something worth uh, mentioning and the second thing uh, although there, we will need to have some funding there um, is that i would love to use this panel for uh, shear tests so what you can do you can heat your specimen um, remove the panel quite easily and do a, a, a shear test on a concrete specimen, which is otherwise, I would say, quite difficult or, or dangerous for the furnace or something like that. Very good. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for sh sharing this. Very interesting. It sounds like you're going to be busy at, uh, at the end. Thank you again. Uh, thank you to the whole team and, and Ruben for these great presentations and Q&As.